chromosomes. Uh, this is the paper from Nature a little more than a year ago. And I put up a little of the paper. I'm sorry it's technical, but look at what it says. Chromosome 2 is unique to our lineage. It emerged as a result of a head-to-head -head fusion of two chromosomes that remain separate in other primates. Those of you who have not kept up with how much we know about the genome uh, should pay attention to this, because you'll be amazed at how precisely we can look at things. The precise fusion site has been located at base number 114,455,823, 214,455,838. In other words, within 15 bases. And you'll notice multiple subtelomeric duplications, the telomeres that don't belong. And lo and behold, um, the centromere that is inactivated corresponds to chimp chromosome 13. It's there. It's testable. It confirms the prediction of evolution. How would intelligent design explain this? Only one way, by shrugging and saying, that's the way the designer made it. No reason, no rhyme. Presumably, there's a designer who designed human chromosome number two to make it look as if it was formed by the fusion from a private ancestor. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm a theist in, in the broadest sense. I would say I believe in a designer. But you know what? I don't believe in a deceptive one. I don't believe in one who would do this to try to fool us. And therefore, I think this is authentic. And it tells us something about our ancestry. Third thing that was abundantly clear at the trial, these great icons of intelligent design, the things that are supposedly unevolvable, they've fallen apart. Example, specifically taken apart at the trial, the notion that the bacterial flagellum couldn't have been produced by evolution, or the blood clotting cascade, or the generation of biological information. I don't have time to talk about all three, but I'm going to show you two of them. Um, the notion that these complicated biochemical structures couldn't have been produced by evolution has been championed by Michael Behe. And Behe has an idea that he calls irreducible complexity. And he says, you can't evolve these things because they're irreducibly complex. Notice what he says. An irreducibly complex system can't be produced the way that evolution works by numerous successive slight modifications of a precursor system because any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. These are multi-part systems. And he's basically telling you that the 30 or 40 proteins that are in here, they all have to be together or there's no function. And since natural selection does have to work gradually, I agree on that point, um, it can't produce 20, 25, 26 proteins knowing what will eventually happen because natural selection is blind, which is indeed absolutely true. So the poster child for intelligent design by any standard, it shows up so often, it really could be called the poster child, is in fact the bacterial flagellum. This was mentioned so often in the trial that the judge, uh, probably from t fatigue, got a little sarcastic about it. One of the attorneys said, Your Honor, when we reconvene, we're going to talk again about the bacterial flagellum. And the judge at one point said, Oh, goody. Um, <laughs> the last expert witness for the Board of Education, a biochemist named Scott Minnick from the University of Idaho, was called up to the stands to talk about this. And since Behe had talked about it, and the lawyers had talked about it, and they had argued about it, and I had talked about it, as I'm going to show you here for a second, Minich got up there, and he said he was going to talk about the bacterial flagellum, and the judge, uh, the judge deadpanned, well, we've heard that before. And Minnick turned to him, this is the best line of the trial, Minnick turned to him and said, you know, Your Honor, I sort of feel like Zsa, Zsa Gabor's fifth husband. I know what to do, I just don't know how to make it exciting. Um, and uh, so I, I take my hat off to Scott. That was good. I like that. Um, so what, what is this argument about? Here, here's the argument in very simplified form. Um, if you have a complex, multi-part biochemical machine composed of many parts, its function, everyone agrees, can be favored by natural selection. But the argument is that evolution can't produce them because the individual parts have no function of their own. That's what irreducible complexity means. So natural selection can't make this, doesn't have any function. Can't make that, can't make that. Um, therefore, you can't evolve a structure like this. Now, how does evolution explain something like that? Well, ever since Darwin, we've had a very good explanation. Um, and that is these complicated machines, they don't arise from scratch. They arise from combinations of components that have different functions, functions of their own. And the components originate with functions of their own as well. Therefore, natural selection will work every step of the way. Now, that's not evidence. That's just an argument. But the beauty of this is we can now hold these two ideas up against each other 
and we can say, who's right? If irreducible complexity is right, then the parts of these machines should be absolutely useless. But if evolution is right, we should be able to take these machines, look at their parts, and discover, wow, they do other jobs. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's take the bacterial flagellum. So if we start with the flagellum, here it is, and these drawings name the genes and the proteins in the flagellum, and we say, let's take away a whole bunch of the parts. How many? Um, not one, not five, not ten. Let's take 40 of its 50 parts away. Now watch very carefully, because I'm going to do that experiment right there. There it goes. The parts are all gone and I have left 10 parts that span the membrane. What are left behind are 10 proteins in the base of the flagellum. Now, if irreducible complexity is right, this should be absolutely functionless. It should have no function. But if you'll pardon the double negative, what is left behind is not non-functional. What is left behind is the type 3 secretory system, and it is fully functional. I know most of you in the room are going, of course, the type 3 secretory system. <laughs> The type 3 secretory system is a molecular syringe in which some of the nastiest protein, uh, 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 bacteria on this planet produce toxic proteins, grab onto one of our cells, and inject those proteins into our cells. The bacterium that causes bubonic plague works this way. It's really nasty stuff. Well, guess what? The 10 proteins that make up the type 3 secretory system are directly homologous to the 10 proteins in the base of the bacterial flagellum. They don't produce movement. They're not a flagellum. But are they functional? They are fully functional. So remember that claim. Any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. This guy is missing 40 parts, and it is perfectly functional. What that means, there's no other word for it, is that that statement is wrong. Now, that's not an incidental statement. That is the heart and soul of the intelligent design argument. And in this case, it turns out to be wrong. Now, it's even wronger than that, because it turns out that not only do these proteins make up the type 3 secretory apparatus, but almost every protein in the bacterial flagellum is strongly homologous to proteins that have other functions elsewhere in the cell. And what that means is when we look at this wonderful icon of intelligent design, a careful analysis of the flagellum actually matches evolutionary theory, namely the parts should have functions of their own and not the intelligent design prediction. And that's simply a fact. Now, intelligent design does no better when it talks about blood clotting. Um, I'm sure you all know that blood can clot. And many of you who have had the misfortune to take biochemistry as a college course also know that there is a complicated pathway of proteins that is responsible for blood clotting. Dr. Behe argues, and intelligent design argues, that pathway is irreducibly complex. And again, what does he mean? None of these proteins do anything except clot. In the absence of any of them, blood does not clot and the system fails. So the argument is the reason we know a creator had to create it or design it is because all the parts have to be present together. And the reason we know that is in the absence of any of the components, blood doesn't clot and the system fails. Now, this is an argument made by Michael Behe. But it's also an argument that the Dover Board of Education wanted to present to their students. They got a copy, they got 60 copies, two classroom sets, of this intelligent design textbook, Pandas and People. Pandas and People makes the exact same claim. Only when all the components are present does the system function properly, even though, uh, and us nasty evolutionary biologists point out, that all of these proteins, are almost all of them are serine proteases which means they were probably formed by successive rounds of gene duplication. But once again, they say all the proteins, no, nothing, unequ nothing equivocal here, all the proteins have to be present simultaneously for the clotting system to function. That's very interesting. Being an empirical scientist, I always want to say, is that right? Well, how could we test it? We could test it by taking this wonderfully complicated system and let's take a component away. Let's knock one out and see if they're right. Well, the first one that we can knock out, because nature's done the experiment for us, is factor 12. Um, what happens if we knock out factor 12? Another PowerPoint experiment, there it goes. Factor 12 is gone. Will blood still clot? Well, not in us, but it turns out that whales and dolphins lack factor 12. It's actually an evolutionary adaptation to deep sea diving, and their blood clots just fine. That means that proposition that they all have to be present is wrong. Now, taking one away, that's kind of chintzy. Take, take a few more than one.